¿Qué tal? Muy buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos. This is my uh, first time on a Jumbotron, so I'd appreciate your attention. My name is Daniel Mark. Uh, I'm a professor at Philadelphia's own Villanova University. Uh, this year, this year a visiting fellow uh, at the James Madison program at Princeton University, but coming right back to Villanova. Uh, and I also serve on the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. And I thank you for coming here today, for joining us in Philadelphia, the world meeting and at this very special address. According to the Jewish tradition, the words of the Shema prayer are the first words a newborn child hears her parents speak. They are also the last words on a person's lips before he passes into eternal sleep. And in accordance with the injunction in the prayer itself, they are recited each morning and each evening, thereby framing each day as well as the long day of life from the morning time of birth to the evening time of death. Both structurally and substantively, the Shema is at the heart of the Jewish liturgy, a twice daily statement of faith and a reminder of our duties in light of God's faithfulness to us. It is the only prayer in the Jews' regular liturgy commanded and composed by the Lord himself. The rabbis teach that the Shema demands of us complete sacrifice, whether of our money or even our lives. Allow me to recite this brief paragraph in Hebrew and then in English. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha b'chol levavcha u'v'chol nafshecha u'v'chol me'odecha. V'hayu hadvarim ha'ele asher anochi metzavcha hayom al vavecha Vishinantam Levanecha Vidibar Tabam, Vishivtacha Bevetecha Uvelachta Chavaderach, Uvishachbucha Uvkumecha, Ukshartam Liot Ayadecha, Vahilototafot Benenecha, Uchtavtam Amuzuzot Betecha, Uvisharecha. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign on your hand, and they shall be for pendants between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Heavenly Father, let your words be on our lips all day, each day. And through your word, let us know your love so that we may better love others and so that through our love, others may know your love as well. Help us to love others well as an expression of our love for you and as a symbol of your love for us. Grant that we may teach our children your word as the Shema instructs and grant that we may love our children well in the family fully alive so that they may in turn learn to love you and to love others. Let our love for you and your love for us be known through our love for others, for every person and especially for those most in need, for those suffering physically, emotionally, financially, and spiritually. Let us love you, Lord, by helping us to love them with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our might. May we be your partner in bringing comfort and physical, physical healing to those who need, friendship and emotional support to those who need, employment and economic assistance to those who need, and your word to all who need. Lord, may you bless this world meeting of families, its organizers, the Holy Father, our incomparable Archbishop, our Speaker, the eminent Cardinal, and all in attendance so that we may carry this message of love and grace into our families, into our communities, and into the world. May this auspicious moment be an occasion for renewal of our own inner spiritual lives, lives of prayer and reflection and worship of the heart, and from there, flowing outward to our love and care for every member of the human family. And let your words be on our lips as we come and as we go, 
when we sleep and when we wake forever. Amen. Je m'appelle Benoît Talleux, j'ai actuellement 18 ans. Ma, ma name is Benoît Talleux, j'ai été adopté en 1995, j'ai je suis arrivé en France à l'âge de 3 ans. Je... Mais en tout cas, ça s'est bien passé, dans des délais très raisonnables. It... De se laisser guider, de me laisser guider uh, par la providence. Voilà, I was guided by providence et je sais que le Seigneur nous nous aidera. Et je sais qu'il va nous envoyer des enfants pour nous aider. Même si c'est à nous de décider. Même si nous sommes les seuls qui devons décider de continuer ou arrêter l'aventure. La confiance va jusque là. Et je pense que c'est peut-être ça que le monde ne comprend pas. Nous vivons dans un monde qui est plus en plus that is more and more limited in a way and where everything must be controlled, must be programmed, programmed, right? And we have that relationship with God, which is quite hard to understand. Daddy, mommy, these are the first words a child pronounces. Adoption is what allows a child, an orphan, to put a face on these words, daddy and mommy. There is something very deep and legitimate, a pain for an orphan child, since it is deprived of its roots. This is why adoption is so important. I became a son with a name, with a story, with ancestors, with parents, with brothers and sisters as well. Diego is a child who was wanted, who we didn't expect to be born with a syndrome of Down. It caused a lot of pain when we found that he had a disability because he was humanly disabled. Diego has taught us that we all have disabilities and that sometimes they are voluntary. And when I say no, when I say all this, it's transparent. Well, Diego was a blessing for everyone. He taught us a, a sensibilizarnos un poquito más, eh, no sé, a aceptarnos como persona, porque pues él se acepta tal como es. Pues nos enseña a amar de la manera más pura que existe. Como tiene un corazón tan limpio y puro, pues siempre lo podemos amar de la manera más incondicional y sabemos que él nos va a amar de vuelta. Él siempre se acerca cuando estamos tristes, siempre se acerca y siempre busca la manera como de sacarnos una sonrisa. Y siempre es como, ponte feliz y te hace una carita, así, <risa> porque no le gusta verte como triste y así. Entonces, pues, es una bendición enorme. <risa> tú le das amor, te da amor, o sea, y siempre en toda circunstancia es muy amoroso. Entonces, pues como que es el testimonio vivo del amor, Diego, ¿no?, para nosotros. I went into that adventure with that amusing and joyful curiosity, and today my kids still do amaze me. I am the first one to be amazed by the fact that I am the mother of this incredible family. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bishop Timothy Sr. I'm one of the auxiliary bishops here in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia and the rector of St. Charles Barmeo Seminary. And it is with... It is with great joy that I have the privilege of introducing His Eminence Cardinal Tagle, our presenter, their keynote address, the keynote address this afternoon. Cardinal Luis Antonio Tagle is the Archbishop of Manila, Philippines. He has a doctorate in sacred theology from Catholic University of America. And was a member of the International Theological Commission from 1997 to 2002. He is, he is an elected member of the Permanent Council of the Synod of Bishops and an appointed member of six dicasteries in the Vatican, including the Pontifical Council on the Family.
He is a well-sought speaker for local and international conferences and is very visible in, on social media. He maintains a weekly TV show and his Facebook page has more than a half a million followers. Your Eminence, Cardinal Tagle, the Church in the United States has been abundantly blessed and enriched by so many faith-filled, vibrant Filipino Catholics, and in particular in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. And so with great joy, His Eminence, Cardinal Tagle. Why did you sit down? <laughs> Good afternoon to everyone. I bring you warm greetings from the Philippines and from Asia. At the outset, I would like to thank the uh, organizers of the World Meeting of Families, the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, Archbishop Chatti, and uh, the Pontifical Council for Family, uh, Archbishop Paglia, all of you dear friends who come from different parts of the world to celebrate the mystery, the life, and the mission of the family. My task this afternoon is to reflect with you on the family, a home for the wounded heart. Oh. I will try my best. First, I would like to invite you to consider the different types of wounds that we experience and encounter. Then, we will turn to Jesus, the wounded one, whose preaching of the kingdom of God included the ministry of healing. Then we turn to the church, the body of Christ, definitely made up of wounded men and women, yet called to share in the redemptive mission of her Lord and her head, Jesus Christ. And finally, I would offer a few tips on how we as wounded people could be agents of healing in our homes and in the wider home called the church. And since it is the world meeting of families, I brought my own family here. My parents are here, my brother and my cousins. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow, so many people. <laughs> so let us start with some consideration about wounded hearts. Of course, the heart here is not just an organ within the body. When we talk about wounded hearts, we're talking about wounded persons. All people are wounded. I guess no one here in this assembly 
could claim, I have never been wounded. All of us have been wounded and continue to experience wounds in our hearts. There are different types of wounds, some physical, some spiritual, some emotional, some relational, some financial. And there are different causes and different consequences. But whatever the nature might be of a personal wound, it always affects the family and consequently a person's social relationships. All wounds hurt, but wounds are more painful and hurtful when we see our family members suffering. When somebody inflicts a wound on our family member, we are also wounded. They become our own wounds. But most hurtful are the wounds inflicted on someone by his or her own family members. The sacredness of the family is wounded by that. When brothers and sisters fight over money, when relatives fight over a piece of property, and they say, we are fighting for a principle. What type of principle is that? When the piece of land is more important than your brother or sister, but the world calls that principle. <laughs> but this is the mystery of it all. Even when homes are hurt by wounds, it is also the home that is the privileged place for comforting and healing wounded hearts. The wounds may come from the family, but it is also the family that becomes the source of comfort and healing. The wounds that affect our families today are many immense and deep. I don't have time to analyze each one. But just to give you some examples, financial constraints, unemployment, destitution, lack of access to basic human needs, the lack of education, economic and political policies that do not support the families. Of course, failed relationships, infidelity, sickness, disabilities, social, cultural, even religious exclusion or discrimination. Human trafficking, child abuse, domestic violence, the abuse of women, prostitution, new forms of human slavery, wars, ethnic conflicts, climat climatic calamities, forced migration, displacement of peoples, all of these bring wounds 
to human persons and to families. And from your specific contexts, your countries, your regions, maybe you can add to the list that I have just presented. Open your eyes, listen to the cries of the wounded, see the wounds and see the causes of those wounds. Wounds, makes, wounds make persons, families, and communities vulnerable to manipulation, bitterness, despair, exploitation, and even vulnerable to evil, to sin. Some people fall into crime, criminality. They start thinking of evil deeds because of deep wounds. Interior division, the division within me and the external division, conflicts, they all lead to alienation. I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know whether I am accepted by my family. I do not know whether I belong to society. I am an alien. I do not belong. I don't have a home. This is usually the experience of wounded people, alienation homelessness. You may have a big, big, beautiful house and still be homeless. For what is a home? A home is not measured by how many acres you have on which the building called a house sits. No, a home is the gift of a loving presence. I, I remember in my youth a beautiful song. It says, a chair is still a chair even when there's no one sitting there. But a chair is not a house, and a house is not a home when there's no one there to hold you tight, and no one there you can kiss goodnight. That's not the end of the song. It continues, a room is still a room, even when there's nothing there but gloom. But a room is not a house, and a house is not a home when the two of us are far apart and one of us has a broken heart. Let me finish. <laughs> I get wounded too. <laughs> now and then I call your name and suddenly your face appears. But it's just a crazy game. When it ends, it ends in tears. Then the plea, darling, have a heart. Don't let one mistake keep us apart. I'm not meant to live alone. Turn this house into a home. When I climb the stairs and turn the key, oh, please be there, still in love with me.
that's a home. But a house, but a home, a loving presence, the gift of a loving presence, which leads us now to Jesus Christ. The ministry of Jesus. A certain author, Luciano Sandrin, notes that integral to the mission of Jesus which is the proclamation of the reign of God, the kingdom of God, was the healing of the sick, the wounded. The proclamation of the kingdom of God, the dawning of the kingdom of God, was very often accompanied by signs and wonders, especially those of healing. In Matthew 9, verse 35, Jesus continued his tour of all the towns and villages. He taught in their synagogues. He proclaimed the good news of God's reign, and he cured every sickness and disease. And Jesus instructed the 12 to do the same. In Matthew 10, 7 to 8, Jesus says, as you go, make this announcement. The reign of God is at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, heal the leprous, and expel demons. The good news of the reign of God is manifested in healing as caring, assisting people, accompanying them, reconstituting relationships, bringing back a girl to life and restoring her to her family. When God rules, when God reigns, persons are saved, honored, and served with care. Where God rules, wounds are attended to. You see this in the synoptics. You see this in the Gospel of St. John. There seems to be a pattern in Jesus' mission of proclaiming the kingdom accompanied by healing. There is compassion. Jesus is moved with compassion. Then, Jesus cares. Included in the caring of Jesus is his anger towards the evil that befalls a person. And then the attention with which he cares for the person. Then comes faith. Usually the healed person manifests faith in Jesus. But in the end, Jesus would tell them to keep quiet the humility of Jesus, the humility of the healer. The healer will not go around saying, hey, hey, ha, you see that man? He used to be lame. He's able to walk now because of me. Praise me. No. The healer comes to proclaim the kingdom of God, not himself or herself. <clears throat> the proclamation of oneself is the way of the kingdom of this world. That's why the kingdoms of this world operating on ambition, power, self-recognition, they inflict wounds. But Jesus' kingdom is always a humble, serving kingdom. That's why it heals by caring, by compassion, and by love.
Some fathers of the church say that in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus was really talking about himself. Someone attentive to those left dying on the roads. That is Jesus. He was really talking about himself. And we can agree, yes, he is the Good Samaritan. Every person wounded, even if a stranger, even if an enemy, I will love and care for. Remember, in the parable was a Samaritan, which at the time was considered an enemy of the Jews. But if you want to heal, ha, the test is, are you willing to heal even your wounded enemy? Nobody claps. <laughs> I caught you there. <laughs> but Jesus stops and heals even those who plan to persecute him. Remember how in John 13, he washed the feet of his disciples, including those who had planned to betray him. You heal even your enemies. Why? Why? That is the way of the kingdom of God. Very different from the ways of the kingdoms of this world. We all know the parables of mercy in Luke 15, three parables all about lost objects or persons. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. All of them getting lost. But the three parables ended with rejoicing, with feasting, why? Because the lost, now found, is coming home. When you look at the first parable, the lost sheep, the lost sheep probably was sick or wounded. And from a purely pragmatic, economic reason, the shepherd should not leave unattended the 99 healthy sheep to search for the one who is wounded, sick, and lost. That wounded sheep is really a liability. But why? Why would the shepherd look for that sheep? Why will the woman look for one coin? And why will the father welcome with such extravagance the lost son for only one reason. The sheep, though wounded and lost, is my own. It is mine. And if it cannot come home, I will carry it home.
the elder brother castigated the father. This son of yours, this son of yours, you belong together. But the father said, your brother. The father wants the home to be made whole. And it would not be whole if the wounded brother would not be accepted. No other reason. You are mine. And my home will not be complete without you. You cannot come home. I will carry you home. This is how Jesus presents the kingdom of love and mercy. But Jesus does not only heal the symptoms of our wounds. He does not save us from our vulnerability and woundedness. He saves us in our wounds and vulnerability. He entered our woundedness. He became like us except sin. In his incarnation, he embraced a wounded world. He experienced being hunted down by an ambitious politician. He experienced being a refugee in Egypt. He experienced being lost as a teenager. He experienced being branded as crazy. He experienced not having a home. He experienced the taunt, the ridicule, even of religious leaders. He experienced betrayal of a friend. He experienced the humiliating death on the cross given only to criminals. And he was buried in a borrowed tomb. Jesus heals by being wounded. And according to the letter to the Hebrews, he was perfected. He was made perfect as a compassionate high priest, as a compassionate brother, because he was tempted in every way that we are except sin. He knows our wounds, and he transformed our wounds into the triumph of love. That's why even the resurrected Christ had the marks of wounds. The wounds will not disappear. In fact, it is the wounded one that saves. So my dear brothers and sisters, since all of us are wounded, no one should be able to say, I have no gift of healing. No, our wounds will make us, if we want them to be, avenues of understanding, compassion, solidarity, and love. Those who are thirsty, come to the water. Are we still together? Yes. Uh, yes, okay. I now go to my third point. I'm uh, halfway now, halfway through. So from wounds and homes to Jesus, the wounded one who continues 
praying to the Father as our high priest, seated at the right hand of the Father, bearing the marks of his wounds and our wounds in his resurrected life, beautiful to behold. Don't think that in the resurrection, our wounds, the scars will disappear. No, even if, if they, are wood, they are scars, if they are scars of love, of compassion, of solidarity, wow, they are beautiful scars. For the risen one possesses those marks of his loving concern for all of us. Now that leads us to the church, the home for the wounded hearts. By church, we mean the body of Christ that is present in every local congregation, like the parish, like the diocese, like your religious order or society of apostolic life, and most especially, the family, the home, the domestic church, the church in the family. Being the body of Christ, the church shares in Jesus' mission of proclaiming the reign of God through healing, through solidarity, through compassion. St. Paul says in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members share its joy. The church of wounded members Becomes, becomes a church of solidarity and compassion in union with each other, not only in glory, but most especially in wounds. Dear parents, when your child, your son or daughter, will graduate with honors, I always hear this, the remark of one parent, as he or she witnesses you know, the event with tears in his or her eyes. He'll say, oh, my son, my daughter. But when the child does not pass the course and is required to repeat the course, one parent will address the, uh, his or her, the spouse, and say, hey, your son, <laughs> your son must repeat the course. How come when it is about honor, it's my child? When it is a disaster, it is your child. Man, we are one church, one church, one home, one family. The church must embody the redemptive mission of God. Joseph Hartzler, using the insights of the great Canadian theologian Bernard Lonergan says, nowadays, the redemptive mission of the church must be manifested in the church becoming a disciples of authentic persons capable of self-sacrificing love. For it is this type of community that will prevent alienation, loneliness, and further woundedness. Self-sacrificing love. The Second Vatican Council in Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the church, says that the church is the sacrament, the sign and instrument of the intimate union between God and humanity 
and of human beings among themselves. That's at the core of the church, intimate union, communion, love, and not alienation. So at the very core of the church's identity is its mission. You are not there to alienate further. You are there to heal, to unite, and to reconcile. A beautiful image in the Bible of a church that heals even when it is wounded is that small band of friends of a paralytic in Mark 2. You know those four friends who, do, who did everything that they could, but when it was impossible to bring their friend close to Jesus because of the crowd, what did they do? They went up the roof. They opened up the roof to lower G their friend to Jesus. That's a family. That's a parish. That's a diocese. That's the church. No one gives up. I won't give up. We won't give up leading people to the healing touch of Jesus. In the words of Maria Cataldo Canaf, the church opens doors to Jesus and sometimes roofs in order to bring people to Jesus. Let me now go to the last portion. Some paths that we could take so that we could promote Jesus' redemptive mission, inaugurating the reign of God within the church as a home for the wounded. First, we must realize that all healing comes from God. It is the initiative of God. Secondly, Healing is situated best in a community, the family, the parish, the school, the band of friends, without forgetting the involvement of the wounded person. He or she must also be courageous in taking the path towards healing, conversion. Let us not forget the liturgical sacramental aspects, baptism, Eucharist, sacraments of forgiveness, reconciliation, the anointing of the sick, the ethical dimension. Joseph Kelly proposes some practices based on the image of the church as a field hospital an image which is dear to Pope Francis. I see some people taking down notes. Please do. <laughs> there is an exam after this talk. <laughs> Joseph Kelly said, if we are serious about healing in a field hospital setting, first, we must keep in touch with Jesus, the chief physician. We should be humble. We cannot heal simply by our human efforts, even our psychological counseling skills. We all turn to Jesus. Secondly, let us recognize our own wounds. Facing our own wounds will enable us to be compassionate and understanding to the wounded. Third, we should not be afraid of the dark. 
when you deal with wounds, oh my. Wounds are huh, never clean. They could be bloody and raw. We should be ready to enter that dark world. Fourth, we must accept that the church is a field hospital. We should be ready to respond in emergency cases. We should be prompt with creative solutions. We should be agile and flexible. Fifth, we should infuse the field hospital with hope. We cannot be healers if we look desperate. I don't know how those glum-looking people could even generate you know, huh, trust and healing. You know. mm -hmm. Smile, please. <laughs> Sixth, often when we try to heal or help Jesus heal, we have no choice but to be quiet, silent, no words, no solutions. We just provide a loving presence. Discernment is essential. My dear brothers and sisters, my timer here says, I have seven minutes to go. I will spend the last seven minutes telling you stories, for that's what Asians are. We live by stories. I told this story a few days ago in La Salle University. I, I usually attend the summer camp for young people in the diocese. And one summer camp devoted to finding one's purpose in life, vocation, actually, <laughs> one's purpose in life. I gave a keynote address like this, but very short. After that, I opened the floor to questions. And the first question that I got from a young person was, Bishop, will you sing for us? <laughs> Quite unrelated to the topic. So I said, let us go back to the topic. Ask questions about the topic. And they asked questions. And then came another boy. He said, now, Bishop, will you sing for us? So I said, you did not tell me that I would sing. So let me start a song that all of us would sing, which I did. Afterwards, the young people came in good Filipino fashion asked for a blessing, some had selfies, <laughs> some asked for autographs, some asked me to sign their shirts. Here, Bishop, please sign here, please sign here. One young girl said, here, here, sign here. I said, no, 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 turn around, turn around, turn around. And then that's over. But I was thinking, what, what? What do they think of me? <laughs> am, I, am I a singer? Am I a celebrity? What am I? Do I project myself as a bishop or what? The answer came a year later in a similar youth camp. One boy approached me and said, last year I had my shirt signed by you, bishop. I said, oh yes, I remember. He said, I have not washed the shirt. But, he says, every night I fold it, I put it under my pillow. I have not seen my father in years. He's working abroad. He has not been home. But with that shirt and your signature, I know I have a home. I know 
I have a father. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Tante grazie. Un'altra storia. Let me close with this moving story which I will read from an account submitted by a girl, a refugee girl. I was born in the jungle. I was lucky, my mother told me, lucky that I was born when so many around me died. I come from Burma, where thousands have perished in the war between Burmese troops and opposition groups. I was born in the jungle because my parents fled their home to avoid the fighting. When I was in primary school, I had to leave my home village, and from that time on, I would move from village to village to attend school. Until 1992, I visited my parents and brothers and sisters about a year, but I have not seen them since, as I have been unable to return home following the closure by Burmese troops of all roads along the Thai-Burma border. So I must live by myself, stand alone without my parents. I have relatives who live around here, but I know I cannot get my parents' love and care whenever I want. I cannot talk to them whenever I want. When they are sick, I cannot visit and look after them. I realized how much I missed my parents when I was sick. Life as a refugee is so difficult. I badly needed my parents to be with me right there by my bed, but I could not have them. I burst into tears. It was so hard for me. I was unable to see my parents because of the war. Then I realized I was not the only one crying and I felt consoled. I know there are thousands of people who are suffering like me. When will there be peace in Burma? When will the war be over? When will the ethnic issues be solved? After years of moving from place to place, I finally settled in the Kareni refugee camps. I was asked to teach at the camp schools. Before long, however, I was selected for an internship in the Philippines. During my time away, I learned more about human rights, and I am now working with the Jesuit refugee services in the field of education. We are busy supporting Kareni schools in a number of ways. I am happy and can use my education to assist my people in these difficult times. I was not the only one crying. That's home for the wounded heart. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.